radiation. I'm sorry, it's just not dangerous, as dangerous as people think. And before this base committee in the United States came up, the radiation standards were actually reasonable. Um, that is why nuclear power was much more affordable in the 1950s than it is today, because they came with these ridiculous standards that increased the safety requirements and that almost doubled the price. Now, you can obviously see why the oil industry would want to lobby for something of this sort. And unfortunately, Germany, if you go to Germany today, a lot of the Greens in Germany, they came uh, to be known as LNT activists, linear no threshold activists. So they're using the fraudulent model to say that radiation causes leukemia in children, it causes this and that, you can turn green if you touch it. And consequently, the bad model has convinced an industrial sophisticated society like Germany to get rid of its nuclear weapons and it's also radicalized the Austrian Greens, for example. So here's a clear example of what we talked about earlier, scientism influencing public policy. And obviously the oil industry is never going to oppose this, the Greens are never going to oppose it because now they have solar and wind panels to sell. But the reality is radiation is not as dangerous, it's a very poor carcinogen, you need a very high dosage to make uh, the carcinogen. And if you look at where this model comes from, because they had scientific studies behind it in, in the commas, uh, it was a guy who won the, his name was Muller, he won the Nobel Prize, I think it's in the 1940s or somewhere, uh, for basically shooting fruit flies with a lot of radiation. So modern radiation safety standards is based on three fruit, fl fruit flies. That's how shocking it is. Um, at the time when they wrote the standards, they had actual human data from the atomic bomb tests uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's a yeah. repeated experiment. And those things show a very interesting thing. The survivors of the atomic bomb, you can measure it in terms of perimeters, so the radiation closer to the bomb, you have higher radiation. There's a certain level where there's an inverted J-safe, where the population has less cancer than the average, uh, uh, than the general population. And that is what we call radiation for mesis. So a certain amount of radiation might be good for you. Now, if you go into the, uh, um, you're exposed to sunshine, for example, you tan. And you know, that tan protects you against more sunshine in the, pre in, in the future, more UV radiation, okay? So it's the same thing for all radiation. A little bit of it might be good for you. A lot of it is obviously going to kill you. And so we're talking about what they call the hormetic model, the inverted U shape or a J shape if you turn it around. And that's the model that I'm advocating for. And I say, if we base public policy on that, we can make nuclear power much more affordable. We can probably um, save a lot of people from dying from cancers because they people forego radiotherapy because um, they're scared of radiation, things of that sort. So this is one of the most expensive scientific mistakes in human history. Okay, welcome to the show, Hugo Kruger. My name is Kay Van Davani. I'm the host of the Kay Van Davani Connection Show. Uh, really uh, a huge honor and a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've been a fan of yours uh, for some time now, uh, Some, but uh, I started uh, reading your article on Substack, um, but uh, the content that you put out on Twitter is just fascinating. It's just really very succinct, uh, very uh, in-depth uh, on uh, primarily, of course, on on nuclear technology. Uh, so, welcome to the show, Hugo. How, how are well, you doing? <laughs> thank you very much. You know, it's nice to be with you. Um, yeah. So, I, I just give your listeners a background, I suppose, in me. Um, I'm a, a structural engineer. I stay in France, but I'm actually from South Africa originally. Um, and I have a master's in nuclear technology. And to add complications, my wife is from Iran, so I did a lot of research on the geopolitics and the Iranian nuclear thing. And uh, yeah, that's sort of how we got into contact, I suspect. How did you? How did you? I mean, start like focusing or concentrating on 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 these uh, you know topics that you put out that you you know publish on on Twitter and on Substack. Like, what was the motivation, the incentives, or the drive that? I, I, it's, it's interesting because I don't even know if I can put them all together. So a lot of it has to do with energy related stuff. I work in the energy sector and I thought I'd just share some of my experience, things that I know that engineers sort of instinctively know. And, you know, engineers always have the problem. We think everyone knows what we're knowing. So I'm just sharing basic stuff of that sort. And then also I, um, did a lot of, uh, when it comes back from university, I read uh, years ago, um, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and how groupthink happens in scientific uh, thought, and you know how much resistant to change there is in institutions. People just don't want to change their mind. They would stick with the same story, even if it sounds absurd. And then all of a sudden, the next morning, they all change their religion, and then they believe you, you know. And uh, I've seen a lot of this thing in the energy sector, and in particular as it relates to well, Germany now going crazy with its nuclear policy. 
And I think Austria is also sort of in the forefront of this type of thinking in Europe, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a lot of it comes down to group think for me. It's it's not a, a scientific. They use science and they use technology as um, sort of the way they brand themselves. But if you go through the veneer, it, it seems more like a religion, uh, you know, than science, really. Yeah. Uh, is that is that the word like scientism also? You know, when it comes to this whole COVID, uh, whatever scientific fraud and manipulation, or the so-called, you know, it used to be a global global warming. Now it's got climate change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's science by media, right? So um, as right. soon as a scientist comes, they put out a. A statistic which is ominous doesn't mean much, but then the media captures the run of the story, and then the media narrative becomes more important than the scientific one. So that's sort of the scientist process how it starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, COVID was, uh, in my view, a complete scam from the beginning. Um, totally. I, I looked at the, I mean, I interviewed David Rasnick on my YouTube channel, my mm-hmm. son Odyssey, because YouTube sent us into it. David Rasnick worked with Kerry Mullis, who invented the PCR test. Yeah. And when I realized very early on how this test works, I said, well, this thing cannot possibly do what the establishment is claiming it's doing. So all the data, all the stats you're seeing, it's very bogus. I, I've, I've got no confidence in that. The only thing you can look at is a dead body. And then if you look at, for example, what Denis Rancourt did in Canada, he traced all cause mortality with deaths and he shows the government interventions, the media narrative killed the people. It's not a virus, you know? So yeah, that's that's one example of this. Global warming is another one. I've done a lot of uh, research into how that started. It's a very similar one. 1989, James Hansen goes to the US Congress and he tells them it's been the warmest year on record. Um, at that point in time, NASA's budget was about to be cut. So they were looking for a story to scare the public to get the funding. Uh-huh. Okay, so that was a very, you can almost say innocent, you know, sort of lie. But what the scientists at the time didn't expect is that there was already a big environmental movement who would jump onto this issue and throw them money. And now they got prestige and famous and everything. And, and all that follows from that is just sophisticated quackery, really, with the global warming story. Um, I was looking at uh, another issue which was very similar. It's like dogmatic issues is the HIV story. I wrote an article yeah. about this. I was in South Africa. And the same story as COVID. I don't believe that, um, you know, in South Africa, they said our prison killed 250,000 people. But if you actually go into the details, what happened is at the end of the apartheid regime, um, the government made an effort to record the Black Deaths because they didn't record it in the apartheid years. So then that is the difference. And they said, aha, that must be the AIDS pandemic, and therefore we need a billion-dollar program to solve yeah. to solve this fraud. So over and over, you see the same techniques being happened. It's, it's fear, science by media, you know, and, and say it becomes scientism in a certain sense. Radiation is another one, which uh, I think we can talk to about Please. yeah. Yeah. You know what I find, I mean, really astonishing. And, you know, we, we talk about me and my girlfriend, you know, especially I just we mentioned our two year old uh, daughter, um, uh, off the record. And, uh, it just, um, uh, we're thinking, you know, we're, we're definitely going to do homeschooling. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're definitely not going to send our school into, you know, I mean, there's people, I mean, we are, we're in Austria, but there's people in, in Germany. I, I used to know that just, just, uh, just for the purpose. So that just for the, just for, in order not to send their kids into school, they, uh, they moved out of Germany. They went to Paraguay, you know? So this is how bad it is. Like the indoctrination camp and, uh, um, I mean, I, I woke up, uh, thankfully, you know, uh, a few decades ago, you know, about this whole, the whole matrix, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's, you go it's, like it's one lie after, after another. another. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And, and the problem is, if you say one is doesn't make sense, they say, OK, you're a bit crazy. Now, if you say two, three, you know, you're already a conspiracy theorist. You're really yep. crazy in the process. Right. Yeah. So you can't win against the establishment narrative in a certain sense. You can only do it for yourself. I mean, you said you send your daughter to private schools and or your child. Um you know, I have, I have some empathy with that view. But on the other hand, you know, I went through schools in South Africa towards, towards the end of the apartheid era. They had the same level of indoctrination. Yeah. I think when I woke up was um, it was about 10 or 11. And uh, we were still being taught the old apartheid era. So all these great white leaders of South Africa. Then the curriculum changed. So the government, the system took time to catch up with the new dogma. And then they said, look at our new great leaders. And the old leaders are enemies. And I realized a child old, that doesn't add up. So, you know, I think if... You know, if somebody goes to a government school, I'm not against that because most parents can't afford homeschooling. Um, I think you must just try and encourage your child to think for himself and do not trust everything that your teacher tells them. And I think they'll be okay. You know, it doesn't matter which system they go through. I think, uh, you know, I mean, I used to go to a very, you know, conservative, very sort of called elite schools in Austria and Vienna. And uh, I also studied law. I even did a PhD later on. But 
Uh, I mean, it depends also, you know, what kind of friends you have, what's the environment, what kind mm -hmm. of you know, people you interact with, uh, what kind of experiences. And I also spent like five years in the United States, you know, back and forth between Austria and the United States. So I guess it's also that it depends, you know, on the depth or the the, the degree of, uh, you know, inspirations you get, the, the conversations you have, the, the oh. experiences you have, you know. So it's not everybody that wakes up, but um, still, I mean, uh, after decades, you know, of mainstream, a conventional, you know, indoctrination, dogmatization, you ask, you begin asking yourself, like, what have I really, like, learned in school? Like, have I ever, did we ever learn to question anything? Did we ever <laughs> learn to question, like, I mean, I used to have, like, super grades, you know, in mm. all those subjects, not not like mathematics, or, but, but like chemistry, physics, all these, like, geography, all these things, but... I, you know, we never learned like to question <laughs> the narrative, you know, the, the things that are just, just... but the, the school is not there to, to make you question things. It's to indoctrinate <laughs> exactly. you. So indoctrinate enough people to pass through the system to become very good managerial, you know, elites of the system. Um, and I think most people actually fall out. Most people are halfway through saying, I can't take this crap anymore. I just can't, you know, continue with this nonsense and they fall out and we call them dropouts. So we call them, you know, um, children who disrupt class or things of that sort. I think they're sometimes the guys you need to listen to because they just can't stand it. So the system selects for obedience and conformity. And look, I, I'm, I'm, you know, a product of the system to a large extent. And to some point, you know, I, you just put your head down and you say, I, this doesn't make sense. There's stupidity, but I have to do it to pass through it. And I think those things have a, a function as well. The stupid exercises, the stupid questions, they are there to really select those who can be as obedient as long as possible. And that's what the system selects for. So th that's how I understand the purpose of modern education. Yeah. And, you know, it, it relates to every other, you know, topic or, uh, you know, connection that you're trying to make. It's it's everything is so interconnected, but they don't teach you that. They, so you have to really to it's it's a, a I don't think anyone can teach it for you. I think you, you yeah. one day wake up and you're like, OK, I've been lied to about this, this and this. And what else isn't true? And how do I know what's true? You know, that's difficult because now am I going crazy? Am I paranoid? And I, I don't think I, there's some people that have gone that route. I don't think you need to be. I think if you understand uh, one topic I would encourage people to read up is on propaganda. There's the history of it. You know, we think propaganda is something they did in Nazi Germany. Well, yeah, they did, but they also do it in modern societies. And the techniques they are using are very similar. It's advertising. It is the manufacture of consent of Chomsky and Ehrman, you know. It is uh, Walter Lippmann, Edward Bernays, all these uh, using psychology exactly. to manipulate yeah. the population. Yeah. And, and if you understand those point, techniques, right? you'll yeah. see through a lot of this stuff, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When I when I read that book about because I, I my my PhD work was on the uh, product liability or liability of the cigarette corporations or tobacco industry, you know, about the yeah. highly engineered and uh, highly engineered manipulated drug del drug del delivery device or nicotine delivery device. And it just, you know, the rabbit hole was so fucking, I'm sorry, my language was so fucking deep. It just, uh, you know, uh, beginning with the uh, addictive enhancing technologies, uh, marketing to or studying on uh, of, of the behaviors of three to five year old children. And, and you know, it really, the rabbit hole goes super deep. So, uh, and then I, you know, I read this book about, um, uh, of, of uh, or about, uh, yeah, you just, you just named him, sorry. The, the, yeah, it was, was nice. Yeah, exactly. Edward Benes. It was a nephew yeah. of Sigmund Freud. Yeah. 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 So that, that opened my eyes. <laughs> like they, <laughs> they had their own, like, like really super sophisticated, uh, public relation and advertising and marketing strategies, how to send, you know, they connected it with emancipation, you know, of women, sent the women out. They had their own photographers and cameramen, you know, and their own. You know, if, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, which is even worse than tobacco, it's the sugar industry. Yeah. How yeah. A but lot they of... learned, you know, but the sugar industry learned actually the strategies from the, uh, from the, like every the, other. Or, or tobacco from sugar, from some from people have the... argued. Um, Gary Talbs wrote the book, The Case Against Sugar, and he argues that the tobacco industry manipulated the sugar. But I mean, I find many of the childhood cartoons we've, you know, we saw, like, let's get an ice cream, little cartoon man goes, you know, let's lick this. It's all to brand sugar at one stage. So, you know, there's a lot of this stuff going on. <laughs> and I, unfortunately, we live in a, in a modern society where we're just flooded with ads. Yeah. Like it, it is Constantly. most of the yeah. messaging you get from especially corporate funded media is going to be distorted to present some kind of agenda. You know, even if the information is true and accurate, you know, all propaganda is some element that's true. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. 
But they, you need to ask yourself always of the media, why am I getting this message at this time and this one? And, and a good example would be the political elections. So, you know, new candidate comes in Austria, and before you know, two weeks before the election is a sex scandal, as if that has ever been, you know, shocking that a politician have had a sex scandal. But now it's in the media, now it's a scandal. Of course, it's about taking him down. It's mafia techniques, right? And they do this all the time with so many topics. Exactly, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a classical pattern. I don't know yeah. what to say. I mean, yeah. Um, let me see. So before we go, I mean, the main uh, topic, of course, I want to talk to you about is, and uh, I know you have a really uh, in-depth knowledge and 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 comprehension about this whole uh, nu nuclear technology, nuclear deal of Iran. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, let me. Okay, there is a lot of misconceptions about nuclear technology or or radioactivity. Yeah. And you know, in connection with the nuclear, you know, nuclear weapon technology and everything, what are maybe we should talk about? Like, what are the misconceptions? What are the stigmatization? What is like the total well, like a lack of comprehension? Um, well, I mean, sort of asking where does one start? Um, first of all, um, nuclear weapons. Let's let's start there, right? Are destructive. They can make a big boom in a city, but then you have a radiation fallout, right? It's not clear to me that that fallout is dangerous as dangerous as people think it is. It might be high doses. So the argument about radiation, radiation safety standards that we have today was lobbied for by guess who the fossil fuel industry. And so that was a shocker. And they came up in the 1950s when Eisenhower instructed the US, uh, the Bayes Commission in the United States, to look into the effect of radiation on a population because they did a lot of nuclear bomb tests and radiation was background radiation was rising across the world. People were rightfully concerned about this. So Eisenhower gave an instruction to a panel of geneticists to look into it. And this panel of geneticists was stacked by people who worked for Guess Who, the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay. The Health Physicist Society of the United States has actually undug it. And I had a conversation with the man who did the most research into it, Dr. Edward Calabrese at the University of Amherst. So they came up with a model which was called LNT, linear no threshold. And this model tells you that no dose of radiation is ever safe, zero. So if you take it to its logical conclusion, if you have an x-ray, you're supposed to die because of cancer. Okay, you're supposed to, um, if you eat a banana, there you get radiation doses, that's supposed to give you cancer. So that's absolutely not true. Now, there are areas in the world where background radiation is higher than what we consider safe for nuclear plant workers. So nuclear plant workers cannot be exposed to more than 20 millisieverts per year. That's the dosage they use. But if you go to Ramsar, Iran, where I was just one month ago, it's 250 millisieverts. Okay, it's it's something like 10 times higher than uh, background radiation. So they're the ones we consider safe. So obviously those people are not dying. That area is green and lush. That's where the Shah had his holiday palace. Um, Radiation, I'm sorry, it's just not dangerous, as dangerous as people think. And before this base committee in the United States came up, the radiation standards were actually reasonable. Um, that is why nuclear power was much more affordable in the 1950s than it is today, because they came with these ridiculous standards that increased the safety requirements, and that almost doubled the price. Now, you can obviously see why the oil industry would want to lobby for something of this sort. And unfortunately, Germany... If you go to Germany today, a lot of the Greens in Germany, they've came uh, to be known as LNT activists, linear no threshold activists. So they're using the fraudulent model to say that radiation causes leukemia in children, it causes this and that, you can turn green if you touch it. And consequently, the bad model has convinced an uh, industrial sophisticated society like Germany to get rid of its nuclear weapons. And it's also radicalized the Austrian Greens, for example. So here's a clear example of what we talked about earlier, scientism influencing public policy. And obviously the oil industry is never going to oppose this. The Greens are never going to oppose it because now they have solar and wind panels to sell. But the reality is radiation is not as dangerous. It's a very poor carcinogen. You need a very high dosage to make uh, the carcinogen. And if you look at where this model comes from, because they had scientific studies behind it in, in, in the commas, uh, it was a guy who won the, whose name was Muller. He won the Nobel Prize, I think it's in the 1940s or somewhere. Uh, for basically shooting fruit flies with a lot of radiation. So modern radiation safety standards is based on three fruit, fl fruit flies. That's how shocking it is. Um, at the time when they wrote the standards, they had actual human data from the atomic bomb tests uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's a yeah. repeated experiment. And those things show a very interesting thing. The survivors of the atomic bomb, you can measure it in terms of perimeters, so the radiation closer to the bomb, you have higher radiation. 
there's a certain level where there's an inverted J shape where the population is less cancer than the average uh, uh, than the general population, and that is what we call radiation hormesis. So a certain amount of radiation might be good for you. Now, if you go into the uh, um, you're exposed to sunshine, for example, you tan. And you know that tan protects you against more sunshine in the pre in, in the future, more UV radiation. Okay, so it's the same thing for all radiation. A little bit of it might be good for you. A lot of it is obviously going to kill you. And so we're talking about what they call the hormetic model, the inverted U shape or a J shape if you turn it around. And that's the model that I'm advocating for. And I say if we base public policy on that, we can make nuclear power much more affordable. We can probably um, save a lot of people from dying from cancers because they people forego radiotherapy because um, they're scared of radiation, things of that sort. So this is one of the most expensive scientific mistakes in human history. Fascinating. So it goes, <laughs> again, this is like so classical, it goes always back to like fraudulent, not, not fraudulent, but like false... Yeah, uh, studies or or data uh... or, or bad bad studies that got promoted for political purposes. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so even at the time, because what this guy with the fruit flies did is he shot it with a lot of radiation, and he proved that radiation causes gene mutations, which was yeah. true at that high dosage. And then they took a line, they extrapolated down. Right. And it's, but right. nature doesn't have a straight line because if you heal from radiation, that's a that's an S shape or a J shaped curve, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's sort of how it started. And it was similar to, to global, global warming, for example, when Hansen came to Congress. There was no science behind what he said originally. It was just a political agenda. Exactly. And this is the same thing. The, the guy who published it, I don't even blame him, but I blame him for not saying anything after his studies got promoted. Because, you see, when it got promoted, then he became the famous Nobel Prize winning scientist. Mm -hmm. You know, so all the ambitions and the incentives were in the direction. And you see this happen over and over again, where the scientific theory is not accepted because it's scientifically proven, but because the group accepts it. It becomes propaganda. And there's a, a theory, the name for this in science, it's called the gold effect. Uh, COVID's a very good, because uh, uh, it's named after Tommy Gold, who get, you know, first came across it. And the COVID's a very good example of this as well. Yeah. I mean, the original science that came out of Wuhan was very sloppy. Mm -hmm. And yet we just accepted it in the media ran of the story. And now we locked down the world economy, right? Based on something that was very bogus from the beginning. Yeah, so, so many misconceptions and just uh, narratives. You know, I I, um, I watched a documentary about Chernobyl a long time ago, and uh, there was an old lady who, very old uh, uh, woman who, um, probably in her 80s or 90s, who, who still lived there yeah. <laughs> uh, near Chernobyl, not for really, like literally near the center. And she was all, you know, she was super healthy. She, yeah. she had a good life. So... Uh, what what does it show? I mean, what does well, well, the consequence of this? I spoke to Wade Ellison, uh, who's professor at, at um, he's at Oxford. He's a professor in in nuclear physics, and he's one of the biggest uh, skeptics against the LNT model. I spoke to him about it last week, and I asked him this question. He said, "Well, Chernobyl and Fukushima should never have been evacuated." He wrote an article after the Fukushima accident, and he said, "Everyone can go home." One week afterwards, that was written for the BBC. They ignored him and he showed values there, good estimates. His estimates were a little bit off, maybe a bit low, but it doesn't matter. He showed that we should never have evacuated. And there's, there's good evidence for it. The best control group is the animals at Chernobyl, because animals don't watch scary Hollywood films, right? And the animals are fine. They are birds staying in a sarcophagus. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, so the birds are radioactive, yeah, but they're fine. So, so what does it tell you? It tells you that what we've been told about radiation is complete bogus. But you see, now you'd extend this to... Uh, geopolitics, because the threat of nuclear weapons is not just a big blast, it is the fallout, it is the dangers, it is the nuclear winter. And I'm saying a lot of this stuff is, there's no evidence for that. Right. You know? So, so you know, it, it means that we should not be as scared of nuclear weapons. I'm still scared of the blast. I mean, I wouldn't accept that. But I'm not scared of living in an area that's been hit by a nuclear bomb. Another interesting stat is if you take Utah, so Utah is next to Nevada in the US. In Nevada, they dropped 12 nuclear bombs. The cloud, the fallout went over villages in Utah that had no protection. Utah has the lowest rate of cancer in the United States. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Right. So it shows you again this hormetic curve. A little bit of radiation might be good for you. Okay. But fear is the is the main component. Like, why do you think that's why uh, this uh, the the blocking or I don't know what do you call it the delaying of uh, further development or building yeah. of new nuclear reactors is is that fear that's been instilled into the society that's like oh. yeah. But you see, the fear is informed from a model that tells you no dose is safe. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and now I appeal to human imagination. I make Hollywood films. I make a, a series like Chernobyl, and I show all this danger. And you know, so you, you, the media is a very good story. And it also it happened in the backdrop of the Cold War, where there was this nuclear scare going on. So all of that imagination is driving the fear. But my view is, if the regulators come one day and they actually just review the models, and the French regulators actually done it, but they put it in secret. They don't put it publicly. Um, French regulators have said at least by a factor of 10 we can relax our safety standards. The French, uh, I think it's French Radiological Society, the US Health Physicist Society has said the same thing, but the national regulators have not made that statement yet because they're too scared. Because it would be an admission that what they've been telling people for the last, well, how many years, at 60, 70 years is complete nonsense. They would lose not only their face, but like totally like credibility. Well, I, I mean, the consequence is you, you have to fire half the guys working in nuclear safety. You don't need them anymore. Uh -huh. You probably don't need many of the arms of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And all the scary story about Iran and having nuclear weapons and things like that, we can calm down a little bit because essentially what I'm saying is a nuclear weapon is no better than bombing a city with a lot of uh, um, conventional bombs. And if you look at the data, it's supported by that. The amount of people who died in Hiroshima is very similar to those who died during the bombing of Berlin. Mm -hmm. You know, So is a nuclear weapon really as dangerous compared to conventional weapons? I, I don't think so You know, from that perspective. Yes, one blast is, but they're actually very useless in a war. Right, right. Okay, so you mentioned Iran already. So uh, let's go into like uh, into the, this this um, subject. Um, mm. So I know for a fact that a lot of preparation went into um, you know the what do you call it until this this nuclear deal. What is it, what, what was it called? Joint comprehensive. J yeah, JCPOA. Plan? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of preparation, a, a long time. I think it was like six, seven, eight years, I don't, I don't yeah. know, but, but like many years of preparation went to this diplomatic, you know, consultation or whatever, like negotiations, talks, uh, all kinds of, you know, inspections, probably all kinds of things uh, went on. And then, and then uh, who came? Uh, then came Trump. Um, and uh, because Obama was like totally for, right. He was the, wasn't he the initiator? I mean, I'm not a fan yeah. of Obama whatsoever, but, but was he like the, the initiator of this nuclear deal? So, I mean, I'll give you the backdrop of it, I think it's important. So, um, we know that the United States fabric used false evidence to show that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. That evidence was handed over to the German intelligence by an Iraqi scientist who went under the name of Curveball at the time, in 2003. And the German intelligence flagged this source and said, this is dodgy, you should not trust him. The U.S. just accepted it and said, well, we have evidence of Saddam's WMDs and the anthrax scare came and the invasion of Iraq came. Okay. At the same time, German intelligence received another tip off from uh, that Iraq, uh, that Iran was prepared was uh, as a nuclear weapons program. Now, if you look at the history of Iran's nuclear weapons program, Iran um, had a program under the Shah. When Khomeini came to power in 1979, he said nuclear weapon, nuclear power is from the devil. Okay. He did not like, he made a religious conviction against nuclear power. Okay. They were skeptical. They cut the budget of the Iranian uh, um, nuclear research at the time. Then in the 90s, um, the thinking started changing in Iran. They said, well, we need to finish the reactor at Bushir. Iran's only got one nuclear reactor in Bushir. But to do nuclear power, you need enrichment. So the United States at the time was forcing Iran, did not want Iran to to to, to have a domestic nuclear weapon, a nuclear power program. And they um, basically uh, um, forced the French and the Germans, and the French supplied most of the enrichment to Iran at the time, uh, to stop dealing with Iran. So then the Iranians decided, well, we're going to do our own enrichment. So they went on the black market and they bought it from what was called the Khan Group. It's groups in, in uh, Pakistan, were incidentally the same group that helped South Africa achieve their nuclear weapons. But none of this was ever in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In fact, Iran openly disclosed them and they said to the IAEA, this is what we intend to do, and you can come and check and safeguard us. So Iran at no point has ever violated the Non-Proliferation Treaty. This is very important to communicate. Then comes 2003, the Iraq war is undergoing, and the Bush administration is looking for a war narrative for the invasion of Iran, because the saying was the road to Tehran goes through Baghdad. So what happens? The Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad, hands over fabricated evidence that Iran has a nuclear uh, a weapons program to what is called the MEK, the Mujahideen Kelp. Now, they are a terrorist group staying in Paris, and they hand it over to German intelligence. Okay, The Germans already flagged it and said, guys, this is just ridiculous. Okay, USA, the CIA makes an estimate in 2005 based on the 2003 evidence that Iran has a nuclear weapons program, and 
at the same time, the head of the German intelligence, he goes to the Wall Street Journal, he said, guys, why is Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, saying Iran has nuclear weapons based on stuff that we flagged as unreliable evidence? Okay, so the United States ran a war narrative based on falsified evidence. And until today, there is no evidence that Iran has ever had a nuclear weapons program. They have their own enrichment program. They have a nuclear capability program. Now, it's very important to distinguish it. Their argument is we can spin enough centrifuges for attention, but we don't get a weapon. Okay, and that is the same policy that's consistent since the time of the Shah. Exactly. In fact, in and, fact, and now, uh, let me ask you, let me interrupt you just a quick, uh, because you said uh, in Boucher, right? Was it yeah. in Boucher? So, so in Boucher, there was this still sort of, um, uh, it was sort of... Um, it was incomplete reactor, yeah. Incomplete. But it, but that was from the Shah times, right? Yeah. Because, okay. And, but was there a plan like under Shah? Because, I mean, uh, the Shah was sort of a more or less a puppet of the... He was a puppet of the USA. <laughs> The, the, the Shah in Isfahan, there was a research laboratory, but as far as we know, all of the programs of the Shah that had military applications, it wasn't even sure if he had one, to be honest. Um, Gareth Porter wrote about this in his book, The Manufactured Crisis. Um, you know, all of those things were closed down by the revolutionary government. They cut the funding. Many of the Iranian scientists of the time left and, and they went for the United States. So it was, and the reason for this is important. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, we know Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Iran. Iran has been, um, it's the only country since the First World War to have suffered chemical burns. And the Iranian doctors are the world's experts in treating people with chemical and biological wounds. Oh. Okay. Khomeini issued a fatwa at that time against chemical and biological and nuclear weapons. Yeah. Okay. And he made the argument that if we do use these weapons, we are no better than Saddam Hussein. So if you use, I mean, if you know, you know anything from Iranian society, the Iran Iraq war is a big deal over there. And if you use that as a basis for any decision, that's usually a decision that's final. So there's a fatwa against nuclear weapons. And when Khamenei came to power until 2012, which was the last time he made a statement, I believe, he said that we don't want nuclear weapons. He made it absolutely clear. And that was understood by everyone. Now, there was a time in the 90s when mem um, rogue elements within the IRCG and um, the Iranian defense try to develop a clandestine nuclear uh, weapons program. They only had a small laboratory of some sort. Uh, how many figured this out after he became supreme leader? And he said, absolutely not. You're going to close that thing down. Okay, so Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. In fact, Iran has gone further and they've asked for a nuclear weapons Middle East uh, free zone. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a point that's that's like totally suppressed. Like, yeah, they. I mean, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm from Iran. I was born yeah. in 1972. Born in 1979, I moved to Austria with my dad, with my father, and mm -hmm. then you know, spent some. And uh, to, I'm, you know, I'm really frank about this. I'm not a fan of of the Iranian regime. <laughs> no, neither am I. But or, I, I don't want a war. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or about Islam. But no, I'm just saying it for the objectivity. Just. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, I gotta leave it. I mean, the wisdom that they have had, uh, not only, you know, regarding the nuclear, uh, you know, the non, uh, sort of non-development of nuclear technology, uh, or nuclear bombs, but also, uh, the, the development and, the, um, the advancement of other technologies, yeah. uh, because, you know, they, I think they had this wisdom, especially on the Khomeini, not Khomeini, mm -hmm. but Khomeini. He said, you know what? It's time that other people copy us and not we copy the others. You know, mm -hmm. so the, the philosophy was behind that. And that's, I think it, it takes a lot of wisdom, uh, uh to, within you know 40 years at least you know since 1979 since the revolution to to take you know to bring in the the brightest you know most intelligent most creative people within you know engineering uh, nuclear science and then eventually you know we could talk about plasma technology uh when it comes to defense technology um uh, to develop and uh, think of, of uh, you know think uh, think for your own uh, think on your own and, and and develop you know technologies that that have not been like uh, you know developed yet or or that 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 just uh, uh, were yeah look, look at this there's a lot of nuance to these things I mean as I say I, I'm no fan or proponent of any uh, religious government either right so I feel very similar to you about it and I think that government can reform itself in many ways in very simplistic ways to change um, but you know we, we need to understand the geopolitics of us if we're honest about of, about the whole thing and I, I just want to say that nuclear weapons free zone treaty is important okay this is something that Jim Chomsky told me if we implement that treaty 
And all it takes is for the United States to put pressure on Israel to open up their nuclear weapons for inspections, which they obviously won't do, because we know Israel has never signed the non-proliferation treaty, and they probably have 70 warheads, right? Um, but if that happens, the entire Middle East will be nuclear weapons free. And then this whole issue, you don't need a JCPOA, you don't need anything, because we know International Atomic Energy Agency inspections work. Iran is subjected to intense inspections. The facility at Natanz has been hacked by the United States and Israel at one at, at one stage. Um, and again, there, there's no indication that they have a nuclear weapons program. At the moment, I think they're going for 60% enrichment because they know you can use that in submarines. So they, they're cleverly playing with the nuances and the laws, but they haven't gone for a full bomb because even if you get 80 or 90% enrichment you need for a weapon, you still need a weapon design program. You still need a military program behind that. It's not that simple. You know, are there people in Iran who might want a nuclear weapon? I don't doubt it. Sure, there are people in the government who would like to overturn the fatwa. But as long as that fatwa remains in power, uh, in effect, I don't think they will have a nuclear weapon. And, you know, if what I'm saying is true over here, and I say this given Gareth Porter's work, it means that the basis for a lot of the sanctions, the basis for a lot of the militarism in the Middle East is complete nonsense. There's no need for that. And to be honest with you, I mean, seriously, I mean, if, if Iran really wanted an, uh, any kind of, you know, whatever size yeah. or, or, or density or whatever, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a specialist on nuclear bombs, but if they really wanted a nuclear bomb, I mean, they they could have gotten it or somehow, you know, either they developed it years or, ago. I mean, South yeah, Africa took eight years to get ours. Probably. Don't you think? I mean, yeah. They, 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 they have not shown intention because they know that if they develop that thing, first of all, you can't use it. Okay, they've got one bomb. Israel's got two. And why would they need it? I mean, unless yeah. you know, you're total psychopath, just offensively want to destroy, and you know, uh, I, I mean, they they will be so isolated diplomatically by both Russia and China as well, who will not tolerate that. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, they figured out that it's best to have a few centrifuges to get the attention of America and Israel if they want to, and those centrifuges remain there to say we can do it theoretically, and I think that's their program, and we should not make more out of it, and it makes complete sense from their point. Of view because if Iran, for example, has a bomb program tomorrow, what will the UAE, what will Egypt, what will all those countries in the region do? They will want one as well. Exactly. So the fact that they don't have one, and by the way, what I'm saying here is been accepted by the Pentagon. It's accepted by the CIA assessment, reassessment. 2005 was wrong. The latest one, I think 2009, said they don't have a program. And even Mossad made the omission. Now, yeah. I mean, if Israeli intelligence is saying this, I mean, it means they know what's uh -huh. going on. So, okay. So let's talk about um, mm. what because it's. I think it's interconnected. Because on the other hand, you know, Iran doesn't need uh, for defense, even even for defensive purposes. Why would you need you know nuclear uh, bombs or whatever nuclear bomb technologies? Yeah, they use this. They, they use the nuclear bomb is very useless. Um, no, because because the conventional, the convent, the very just just the conventional, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of the so called conventional or traditional. Um, rocket technologies or whatever yeah. missile technologies or, or other te uh, you know military technology I, I in my my knowledge and from other experts I heard is so super advanced uh in some parts even uh ahead of some other countries would, yeah. would, would that uh, be well I, I, what I know is they have developed hypersonic missiles but you know you don't even need sophisticated weapons yeah if, if on the opposite side of the Persian Gulf so if you go to Boucher um there's, I think, a base of the IRCG is there, and there's two military bases, two Air Force bases. From Bushir and from the Persian Gulf area, they can launch a ton of rockets into the Saudi Arabian oil fields on the opposite side. You don't need sophisticated weapons for that. And you can bring the world economy to a halt if they want to. Okay, that is their deterrence. Their deterrence is basically, if you attack us, we're going to blow up the Middle East, right? Which is a, a, a very good deterrence there. Then the other deterrence they have is they've been arming in uh, groups in Hezbollah and in uh, Hamas. Although Hamas is not a very good ally for Iran to begin, but Hezbollah was basically to try and pin down Israeli to get them on sort of parity, and even Israeli intelligence has admitted this. So that is sort of the, the geopolitical strategy. You know, I, I personally would like to see um, them change their approach because. First, I would like to see a more diplomatic relations between Israel, Iran and Israel, which from where I, you and I are standing is, seems almost impossible sometimes. Yeah. And between the United States, I would like for the U.S. embassy to reopen there and then to start diplomatic relations. And right. then whatever problem we have, we can work out and, you know, also stop imprisoning so many people that speak out against the government, you know, basic things like that. But th th that, in my view, should be our attitude to Iran. 
It's just like stop this war talk because it hasn't worked since the Iranian revolution. Every time you try and impose sanctions or you try and be harsh with them, what's going to happen? They're going to be they can embolden the hardliners to get into power. They're going to be more militarized in the process. Exactly. And I, I think I was trying to allude to the fact that uh, remember that that scene of the general uh, was it was it from Pentagon or sometimes Joint Chief of uh, maybe it was from yeah. Pentagon. Remember that when he talked on an interview like what was what would have been the military strategy like after Iraq, you know, and then Syria, and then eventually you know so the Wesley Clark, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, so. Uh, do you sometimes, I mean, what, what's your opinion? Like, why hasn't uh, Iran been attacked yet? Is, is it really <laughs> a good because question. They, they, <laughs> they can't, I mean, it would be a suicidal mission or is Iran mm -hmm. already uh, within, the, you know, the last three, four decades has become so strong uh, militarily, defensively and technologically that it just, uh, it just, uh, it would No, I, I think it has to do with the United States' utter blunder in the U.S. invasion of Iraq. The United States invaded Iraq and they basically gave Iraq, which is a majority Shiite country, to Iran on a silver platter. So Iranian diplomatic relations with Iraq has never been better. The United States, by invading Iraq, made one of the biggest geopolitical uh, mistakes in, in, in the century. And they've been systemically negotiated out of the Middle East by not just the Iranians, by the Iraqis, even the Saudis at this stage, the Saudis Chinese. The other thing is, I don't think the oil is as important for America anymore. Um, we have newer technologies, even the solar and wind would extend their work. Um, the United States only gets 7% of the Middle Eastern oil anyways. And the United States military has basically been subsidizing the Chinese economy because China imported most of the Middle Eastern oil. And I think there's a willingness and a fatigue on the American side to not be engaged in the Middle East. I don't doubt for a minute, though, that there are some new conservative voices in America that still wants to see the project of the new American century in the Middle East implemented. But they failed in Iraq. It, it was the, the fact that the Iraqis actually saved Iran from being invaded, because had the invasion of Iraq been a success and had there not been a political change in America, I'm not sure if Iran wouldn't have been invaded, because there were clear battle plans drawn up for the invasion of Iran. And the United States today can still invade Iran if they want to, but they're going um, to, there has been so much resistance within America, I think, against these type of wars. I mean, look at Afghanistan. The United States left Afghanistan. You know, they, they've actually helped Iran in the process of this whole thing. Um, how much, I mean, how much, how much of that, of this, if you just zoom out a little bit, um, uh, how much of that is theater? <laughs> um, good question. I don't know. <laughs> you know that, that, that's always like, um, uh, like a question that's, you know, pounding in my head back there. Like how much of it is really, you know, do they get along in the background? I mean, well, uh, they is, do is, because how much of it um, is a matrix. Is, is, a, is, is how much of it is a show? Uh, you know. Well, well, Iran is a very strange enemy because Iran helped America identify the Afghan targets during the invasion. Iran, um, you know, they had uh, support for America during nine eleven. They even helped sign the nuclear deal. They were cooperative. So th there has been forms of cooperation between Iran and the United States. Now, is it just a real politic on both their sides that they say uh, this is it, or are they working behind the scenes? I don't know. I, I don't think any of us can really tell. Um, the Jewish people. I mean, there are so many Jewish people, even especially Orthodox Jewish people, who who are totally. I mean, uh, you just uh, remember uh, Ahmadinejad. You know, there's. Yeah. I mean, you don't see those videos or photos where they hug each other. You know, and there is a huge, you know, support for the Orthodox Jewish, the, you know, traditional Jewish population. There's a huge, you know, yeah. Jewish uh, community but, and society in Iran. So uh, they haven't left it. Which is to a, be honest, with you, there there needs to be a distinction between uh, the ideology, you know, the hardcore, mm -hmm. you know, mafia like Zionists. And the Jewish people, because we always got along with Jewish people, right? I, I mean, my my grandfather was was Jewish as well. So I'm, you know, I've got. This, I mean, the, the Jews in, in Tehran haven't left, as far as I understand yeah, it. I mean, that's I'm asking. You know, it's just how much theater it is. It? I I think a lot of it is theater because, um, as Gareth Porter explained to me, Israeli tactic has been. Um, to try and pin down the United States in the Middle East, because Israel creates the perception that Iraq is dangerous, the perception that Iran is dangerous, okay? And the perception that Israel will attack Iran tomorrow. But Israel does not have the refueling capability to even take on Hezbollah, okay? So Israel is a bit of a paper tiger type of economy. So Israel wants the United States to be in the, in the Middle East for its own security. 
But does Israel, Netanyahu, really have the intention to go to Iran and come back? I think privately they are far more cautious in their threats. And maybe they're negotiating more behind the scenes, you know. Um, and I think it's, a lot of this is true in Iran as well, because, you know, if you go to the north of Tehran, um, that is where the government officials stay and the wives of the sanction busters, right? Those people live like they're in the West. The women don't wear a job, for example. They're having big houses, big cars. They live like a middle-class lifestyle. So these are the guys running the society, making the rules. But I think they're trying to appeal to the section of the society that still believes in the propaganda all the time. Exactly. But I, I think a lot of it is just, you say, it's a combination between theater and, and empty threats. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm having, I mean, I, mean I, I did, you know, really went into a lot of rabbit holes, but it's even for some experts, I think it's some, a little bit, I don't know, it's just so much this, uh, so much vile of, you know, uh, manipulation and, and, and distractions and, and geopolitics, you know, but I mean, I'm tr always trying, you know, that that's why I'm, I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin, uh, by the way, <laughs> because uh, I think that's the root of it because who controls the money or the issuance of money or the issuance of, of credit, you know, or the entities that are above the law, you know, the city of London, the bank of international settlements, the central banks, like who, like, uh, and as far as I know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Iran not the, one of the very few countries that is not sort of, uh, you know, dominated by or, or you know, or uh, possessed by the sort of uh, what do you call it, central uh, bank. Well, the, the, the bank is cut off from the from the SWIFT system. Okay. Yeah, but they also have their own central banks, and they've also talked about CBDCs. Yeah, see, yeah. So, 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 so uh, what, what yeah. does that tell you? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why you know we need Bitcoin because that's the only that's the only form of uh, information actually. <laughs> well, I, I will say this: I, I learned this when I was now in Iran. Um, you know, the Iranians love trading gold. I've appreciated. You know, I know people talk about gold, but I never understood it. You know, I understood it in an abstract sense. But at the end of the month, every Iranian takes what's left of his salary to buy gold to escape inflation. Yeah. Uh, and there's this massive. If you go to Esfar, you see these massive, um, you know, traders. So I, I thought that's clever. Um, I, I'm still divided. Should I buy gold or Bitcoin? Which one is better? You know, I still think I, I still feel like gold as like a I can see it and touch it type of thing to it. You know, if you're physically like obsessed, buy gold. I mean, it doesn't it wouldn't harm you, of course, but long term, um, I mean, yeah. in terms of exponential by orders of magnitude increase of purchasing power because i mean come on i mean just just look at it seriously i mean every fiat currency every fiat money uh or you know that's been printed out of thin air and uh even even i mean we had a very short time span where re literally uh, money was gold backed right yeah but, yeah but that was a uh, la belle epoque or whatever it's called that you know where even the technologies evolved and everything else and the society evolved because it was hard money but Bitcoin is the hardest money. It is the scarcest money. It is the really, truly one and only unconfiscatable, um, immutable. But, but do, you, do you think the government can't confiscate it? No, I mean, definitely not. No, no, because I can I can memorize right now 12 words if you want. I can go to any country uh, across any border and they can strip search, you know, you know, make me totally naked and strip search me and they can do anything. What I mean, right? Uh, Mm. Even if they put a gun into my to my head, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah, I could, I could no, tell. I, I've thought that they can just attack these big miners and then force them all to. No, to no, that's been that's been up, that's been debunked, Is it? literally by 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 dozens of experts. And they, I mean, it would it would take such an astronomical power, you know. And it's too late. They should have done that, you know, when you know when when the Genesis block or when you know when when Satoshi Nakamoto sort of created the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto in the very first years that that was the the time the only time they could have like uh like uh, what do you call it in English like uh um yeah like made made it totally obsolete and 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 yeah. destroyed it you know but now it's too late the cat is out of the bag after uh literally like 14 14 years now Okay, well, that's. I, I mean, I still have some Bitcoin close to me. I don't put all my keep money, it. my faith in. Keep it. Put it on the cold storage. Don't put it on exchange, and just keep it. 
So I still have I still have the words memorized here. So those twelve words oh, they. they... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So engineer is talking to me. Yeah, <laughs> I could do that. I could memorize probably, but there's other ways like border wallets. You know, you can memorize like a pattern, mm-hmm. and that's all you need. You know, well, I, I guess somebody can stick steal your twelve words. They can also steal your um your gold. You know, so nothing is entirely safe from that perspective. But still, exactly. And how do you verify the authenticity and the you know the the genuine authenticity of gold? That's another problem. You know, mm-hmm. like how 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 do you want to trade like like through time and space? that's that's this is why you know bitcoin makes everything else obsolete i mean it's really a truly phenomenon and 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 it's a truly monetary evolution to be honest with you i mean it's not mm-hmm. it's not and I, it took me some years you know uh it, it, and and i'm not the only one by the way there's like super intelligent people out there who are like uh you know grew up with bitcoin and they say you know uh the, the, it's just so mind-boggling, so amazing what kind of facets and, and aspects Bitcoin has that they they just didn't get it at the beginning, you know? And well, a lot well of- I, I was looking at the performance of Bitcoin compared to South African Rand and the Argentina Peso and things of that sort, and it's doing better than many currencies, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was in, um, I remember when Zimbabwe had hyperinflation years ago, um, because I grew up with Zimbabweans um, who fled from Mugabe's persecution. And when hyperinflation hit, they did something very clever. They started buying assets of people fleeing the country. So people would run away. They bought, bought their cars. They bought um, uh, motorcycles. They bought furniture, anything they could find, right? And they would just drive it to the border to South Africa and exchange it for rents. And they became millionaires overnight. So even when there was hyperinflation, there was a way to make money. So, you know, if ever you see that happening in Europe, or ways of a country, remember, there are ways to, uh, to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, fascinating. And uh, you know, I mean, it's just it's just a matter of time, to be honest with you. It, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, th- uh, the the rate of speed, uh, the the all these processes are ongoing right now. The developments, you know, monetary, geopolitically, uh, hype inflation. I mean, we literally have hype inflation already, actually, in in, in specified like products or services we already have because officially mm-hmm. i think we are talking uh people talk about hype inflation when it exceeds or at, at least like 50 percent or something like that but we, we already have products or services or whatever you know that that already exceeds that you know by far but anyway um it's uh it's coming and there is no way around it you know i mean yeah. just look at the global debt uh with all the unfunded liabilities and the derivatives, it's 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 uh well it's, nobody's nobody's gonna pay back the money. So we're all waiting for we're all wishing that I'm gonna be dead before the debt comes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of that's, that's sort of I mean I'm not an economist or an investor, so I, I don't you know have professed any serious knowledge about it, but just the amount of money that people owe it just doesn't add up to me, you know. It just doesn't add up, no. We're talking about like two quadrillion, yeah. But just, just, just look at like individual, like individual countries, their their mm-hmm. official debt, you know, not yeah. not even counting the unfunded liabilities and the derivatives, you know. It just it's mind boggling, you know. Mm. But uh, okay, let me ask you because uh, I know I don't want to take too much time. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Hugo, so if you, if you zoom out a little bit, what do you see like in the next few years, like in terms of nuclear technology? Uh, are we going to see like uh, you know? Uh, uh, you know, a sort of a technological evolution, abundance, prosperity. Uh, D- difficult saying it because, you know, the energy transition takes, in the past at least, took 30 years per transition. So it's a lifetime for most, I have a lifetime for most people, right? Um, nuclear, we're a bit in trouble because I, I'll be honest, I mean, I'm a proponent of nuclear, but if you have governments, you know, um, passing policies like to make nuclear more strict and can't develop it, there will be no innovation in that field. We need to deregulate nuclear before we can, you know, make it work again. The best, most optimistic scenario for a new reactor in Japan is 15 years, right? That is if they make the decision now and they're still hovering about it. Germany just shut it down. Um, in Europe, we're struggling a little bit because the French can't build them on time. You know, these are issues that the industry has to face. The guys who are building them on time, unfortunately, are the Russians and the South Koreans. So if we're going to see innovation and we come from South Korea, I'm optimistic about what's happening there. They built a reactor in Dubai. Russia's building some in Egypt, but Russian reactors might be sanctioned. I know Poland has shown a great interest in nuclear reactors. Some people have talked about SMRs, but all these things will take a few decades to build, if I'm like truly honest with you. If I'm a salesman, I'll tell you, yes, put your money into it right now. 
But um, because we did not invest and train engineers for such a long period in Europe, there's a skills deficit, there's a knowledge deficit. So all these things has to be retained. And then you need to have politicians with long-term vision, you know, unfortunately, because every nuclear development, at least in the past, has been highly tied to a government that's been favorable to the technology. And it's so easy for governments just to shut it down. So it's one of those tragedy things that I don't think I'm going to see that in the energy sector anytime soon. I work at ITER, the International Thermonuclear Reactor, where they're trying to do fusion. Um, when I was there, they said it would start the first experiment this year. Now they're saying 2025, and I realized they already had a date before I arrived, which was 2018. So these things are getting delayed, and that's the reality of it. Even that announcement they made in the United States about achieving fusion, well, they we're not honest about what they did. If you look at the energy going into the experiment, they did achieve uh, what they call Q greater than one more energy out and in. But if you look at the energy going into the building of the step down by transformers, they didn't achieve it. Right. Okay. So, well, what's so a, is there a lack of resource? Because I don't think it would it would take so much money. I mean, relatively speaking, maybe a few hundred million dollars. It's, it's just a lack of dedication and leadership, I think. I, I mean, yeah. if you look at the amount of money they're spending on renewables at the moment, you could easily take 10% of that and build a few reactors. Exactly, yeah. And get the cost down. Mm. And it, it's a question of standardizing to one design and then building it out, which is what Germany and France used to do when they, built it quite, uh, when they did quite well. Um, but the Germans, they say, they've climbed out of nuclear, and France, so France is recommitting. But recommission, it's not on and off switch, you know, because <laughs> we're stuck in the Silicon Valley, even Bitcoin mindset, where, you know, you can just type a few computer codes and the thing changes. It's not the way in the physical world. Yeah. It takes longer, you know. What about other forms of energy? I mean, do you see any other, uh, like, on the At horizon? the moment, um, at the next 10 decade or so, I think the expansion is going to be solar. I'm not against solar, by the way. Um, wind, I think, is a little bit horrible just for the environmental stuff. What about but hydrogen? It's... Hydrogen, I don't know, conversion, tech... I mean, any well, other... hydrogen's got issues. So hydrogen, to make it, you lose 75% of the energy in the process just before you make it. Mm -hmm. There was a, a calculation done in France 24, last 2019, okay, which is called hydrogen aviation's hype in question mark by a French astronomer called Michael Coriat. And he showed just to run Charles de Gaulle airport, right, you need to use four nuclear power stations to make it efficiently using electrolysis. So there's a lot of hype about hydrogen. I think in the short future, you're going to see solar panels expanding with natural gas. And I don't see an end for natural gas at this stage. A lot of people have been wishing the end of fossil fuels. But I see fossil fuels as sort of like the, the midwife that catches the baby. If none of these technologies work adequately, we use fossil fuels. There's a lot of talk of combining solar panels and wind with heat pumps and things of that sort. And some of this stuff makes sense. Some of it is just bad investment. So I think for the next decade, we're going to see a lot of money being pushed in that direction, whether we like it or not. I suppose I'm skeptical about it, but... That's the, that's the reality. That's what I'm seeing in the industry. Uh -huh. And um, after the economics come in, I think it's it will be a good time to have a good conversation what we should have done, which is put our money into nuclear power. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, but it's a phase that, that humans have gone through. I don't think it's the end of the world like some people preach. I, I'm quite an optimist for the human future. Uh, but I do think that we're making some just obvious strategic blunders about our investment uh -huh. in energy. But that's the way it is, you know. You mentioned, uh, you know, the the term fossil fuel because I, I mean I used to read a lot about this, and, and I think the Russians weren't the Russians like decades ago ahead of us, like in terms of understanding, like. So well, there's a question fossil. if they are abiogenic, right? Um, Tommy yeah. Gold, who I spoke Isn't about earlier, he was like. <laughs> well, the, there's a theory that they made inside of the Earth. That yeah, but within the dynamic decay. Does it like uh, take four or five years even to regenerate itself? I'm not sure. I'm just... Uh, well, methane definitely does regenerate. Some methane is abiogenic. Mm -hmm. But the critique against that argument has been fossil fuels is found in deposits that are located closer to the Earth. And is that really from the thermodynamic decay from underneath or is it from the plant matter? That's a debate. Okay. Um, I so it's, it's still an open question type of thing. Okay. Um, I, I honestly don't, you know, don't know. There's there's a lot of people with, you know, theory that's all abiogenic and um, we're never going to run out of it. I don't think we're going to run out of it anyway in this century. Yeah, yeah, me neither. That's that's a point that I was trying to make. We're not yeah. like, the, you know, it's like... <laughs> no, no, I think Saudi Arabia is enough for the world for 150 years in Iran for 250 yeah. or something. So, like, we, we're okay, you know, if the Middle East supplies us. So. Yeah, we're not going to run out of... 
Well, and we can remake them with synthetic fields. There's lots of like we're not going to run out of fields. I think that's the false. But whether their origin is abiogenic or biotic, or ab was it abiotic or biotic, I think it is. I can't remember the terms now. You know, is it plant matter or is it thermodynamic decay from the earth? That is the question that some geologists are debating. And you're right, the Russians had the theory, but in the West, the guy who had it was Tommy Gold, the guy who the Gold effect is named after, because he questioned the dogma. Ah, and, they, okay. the, and Freeman Dyson, who was also a climate skeptic, incidentally, and a great scientist who replaced uh, Einstein and Princeton. He said he thinks Tommy Gold is correct. So it's that guy said, and that's yeah. where the story comes from. So there's yeah. a very good book called The Myth of Fossil Fields. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna that's written by Tommy Gold, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I'm gonna work to that. Myth of Fossil Fields. Well, anyway, um, Hugo, I, I just think, you know, we need to stay, you know, have an open mind and just, you mm. know, that's why I'm asking these questions because uh, I think uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and fallacies in thinking or, or I don't know, dogmas that we have just, you know. I, I think question everything, right? I think that is the, yeah. the answer for you and your audience. And even if they disagree with both of us, great. You know, tell us why we're wrong. You know, <laughs> tell us why we're idiots. That's, that's part of the discussion, you know. <laughs> Well, Hugo, uh, is there anything else we should have mentioned, or did you? Is there anything you want to uh, besides like uh, you should definitely like uh, tell my listeners where where they can find you, your Substack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I've got a Substack account. It's uh, I think it's hkruger at Substack.com, but it's on my Twitter. You can find me on Twitter. I've got a YouTube channel, and I sometimes write for actually mainstream publications. So I've written for Unheard, I've written for Spiked, and for Newsweek. Oh, really? And, wow. Yeah. Some of some of my articles appear usually with Joel Kotkin, who wrote a book called um, I should just promote his work as well, called New Feudalism: A Warning to the Middle Class. He wrote a new book, Coming of New Feudalism, and he's basically saying the green policies and the policies we're opposing now is creating a new feudal society. Oh, that's all with you. Yeah, we should yeah. talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that is a very um, very good critique against modern society. That absolutely. We are, we are living in, I mean, it's feudalism. I mean, the fact that Bill Gates can take his airplane and I need to check my carbon footprint, that's feudalism. Oh my God, right? this is beyond your hypocrisy, right? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's what, what feudalism was about in the Middle Ages. And that's what we're heading into because of the inequality. So, yeah. Yeah, and definitely uh, my listeners should check that out. And uh, yeah, anything else? Any any other, uh, anything up? Uh, is there anything upcoming, like publications or books or <laughs> I don't know? Um, no, I'm just writing an article at the moment that should be in propaganda and focus within the next few weeks uh, about Iran and the misconceptions of Iran. Oh, that's going to be exciting. Okay. And yeah, that's what I'm currently occupying with. And other than that, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy well, thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge. and. Hopefully we can talk maybe in half on half a year or so <laughs> again. All right. That's great. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, you're good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Talk to you soon. Take yes. care. Bye.